Hello. Um, I want to apologize for not getting this uh, video up uh, yesterday. Um, but what I did is I put something together and um, what I decided to do is just really simplify it. Uh, I wanted to reduce the amount of work that you guys did on the computer today or over the next week um, and just focus on the, the field work that you're doing. So going and looking at the indigenous art. So again, I apologize for not getting this up yesterday. Um, and hopefully it's simple enough that uh, you only have to spend uh, maybe a couple of hours on it. That's it. Uh, hopefully less than that. Uh, so I just want to take you quickly uh, to where you're going to end up with at the end. And then I'll start from the beginning and show you how to how you can gather all your assets and what the assignment page looks like, uh, the submission page looks like, and take you through everything. Make sure you reach out if you have questions. So uh, you're going to end up with a submission from your Myra board. So you're going to be linking, you're going to be submitting a link to a title page. And you're going to build two pages that'll look something like this. They don't have to look exactly like this, but what I want to see is I want to see that you've you've gone there, you've studied this piece, you've taken some photos, and I've given you some options for some extra work you can do if you want to, and that you have taken the time to really observe carefully. So you're going to put here on your Myra board the location. Uh, so the credits, so whose the piece it was, when it was made, what it's called, uh, you know, this other data is really helpful too. So this is a Haida piece by Bill Reed and Douglas Kramer. Uh, it's incredibly beautiful. Uh, and I sh and it was, it's at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. Uh, so then the location, so here, uh, so these are totems and they're part of the Haida House Project, so it's a recreation of a traditional Haida village, and it's located behind, so on the ocean side of the Museum of Anthropology, also called the MOA at UBC. And I think it's actually usually called lowercase o. So MOA at UBC. Um, okay, so the size, I don't know the exact size of these ones, but uh, totems can be over 100 feet tall. So if you're interested, that's 7,200 pikas. Okay. Uh, material, so these are made of red cedar and traditional pigments. And the purpose of a totem is to publicly depict the accomplishments, history, and lineage of a prominent family. So it's not unlike the heraldry that we're used to. So, you know, coat of arms or flags, uh, they were misunderstood and so you know thinking back again to what today is it's day of truth and reconciliation the practice so the craft of making totems was actually prohibited and um, Bill Reed was very instrumental in resurrecting that craft and you know reviving it and bringing it forward super interesting character it's worth reading into who Bill Reed was and his connection to other great BC artists like Emily Carr and Jack Shadbolt. It's a fascinating character um, and his history is really important. So you're gonna assemble your photos. Here you see that I have actually four photos. Uh, I wanted to show you a couple of things that you can do with these photos to make them read better. Here's my selfie and here is a PDF of the color samples so I'll show you how to extract those in Illustrator. All right, so let's get started. And again, this video, um, if you watch it on YouTube, you can skip the parts that are optional. You can move ahead quickly if you know how to do something. You don't have to watch me do the whole thing. Um, hopefully I'm gonna keep it a little bit shorter. So let's, let's get going. So, um, just hide my Myra one. We'll come back to this later. What I want to do is show you the assignment. So these are the things that I asked you to assemble when you went to see a piece of indigenous art. If you didn't get this exactly, don't worry about it too much. I can show you some ways you can get around it. Um, some of these things, the most important thing is actually to collect these two things here when you're there. 
Um, these kind of things are actually much easier to collect on site. So they tend to have, you know, the size, the materials, all this information, it tends to be easier to collect at the gallery or the museum. Um, but if you miss them, you can always find them. You can phone the gallery and they'll give them to you as well. Uh, so uh, if you didn't collect this, I'll show you also how to do it, but make sure you install it because this is a very powerful tool and I'll show you again what it looks like and why it's useful. Uh, okay, so what we're gonna be doing in this tutorial is I'm gonna show you how you gather all your images and uh, this is optional, so I'm going to show you how you can edit your images in Lightroom. Next week, you're going to be shooting photos using Lightroom. Uh, so when you go to on your field trip, you're going to be shooting using Lightroom. This is important because Lightroom has some features that uh, are really powerful. So if you have, if you're a photographer and you have a, you know, a DSLR and you want to use that instead, that's fine. But for most of us. Uh, this is a very powerful app and it, uh, it connects nicely to your desktop and to the Creative Cloud workflow. Uh, so you're going to be extracting colors in Illustrator, so please do that. Um, and you are going to be laying out your text and images and a Maya board. I did this to simplify it, to so reduce the amount of time that you spend doing this. Make sure you create frames and organize the assets using for a frame. You create a title frame and organize your assets using frames. And again, I posted a sample to the one I just showed you. Uh, and then you're gonna submit a formatted link. So again, I will show you how to do that again. So that is gonna be what we're gonna do in this tutorial. And again, on the YouTube page, uh, you'll be able to you know, choose which one you wanna do and click forward, fast forward, go slower, whatever. Just, I wanna make sure that you have the opportunity to move at your own pace and choose your own level of, um, choose your grade. So the amount of work you, you do will depend, will decide whether or not you get an, an, a C, a B, or an A. And then you're gonna submit here using right submission. Okay, so organizing your assets. So again, in your In your uh, GD157 folder, you will have exercises and term projects. Uh, you're going to be placing this in the folder that you created. It's called Four Selections. Again, I've redone this. It's a different ex project from uh, previous classes because I want to include a focus on Indigenous acknowledgement. So if you want to rename that folder, fine, but it's number four. Uh, you're going to save your Illustrator file in here. And under images, you're going to organize your assets. I've divided it into two subfolders, one for each artist. I'd recommend that you do that. And here you can store all your attribution information. So this first one is Bill Reed and Douglas Kramer. Um, I'm not going to rename that. So Bill Reed and Douglas Kramer. <laughs> and uh, these pieces were created between 1960 and 61. And what I focused on is a Haida mortuary pole, and it's at the MOA at UBC. And so these are the images that I collected. And here you can see I have some original images and some images that I edited in Lightroom. There's a few of them. So you can see the difference between the two, how you can, you know, not so much, I'm not so much looking for style here, more just I want to be able to see, I want to show how you can actually um, communicate better the, uh, the details in the image in Lightroom. Uh, and this includes, um, so here you can see it's another example of one that has been edited here. And the original one here. So this one and this one. I'm going to show you how to do that. Lightroom is very powerful. There's also another um, one that I want to show you here. And that is this one here, how you can actually change the ge geometry of an image so that it's um, uh, so it's more accurate to way the way that we perceive it with our human eye. So I'm going to show you how to do that. 
and show you how to export it. And again, those edits that you do in Lightroom are optional. Um, if you didn't shoot with Lightroom, you can actually import the images into Lightroom and edit them from there. Okay, so that's the organization of your file. So make sure that, you know, get home, take your camera, unload the photos into the images folder and organize them before you start working with them. Uh, again, this is important because you can work with a lot of files in digital image making and you have to keep them really well organized. Okay, so let's take a look at Lightroom. So again, this part is uh, optional. And I'm just going to take a minute to export this. Uh, I meant to export it in advance, but I didn't do it. So here, let's do here. And this actually shows you how to export images. So I'm just exporting the original one. So I have both to compare. So I'm going back here, make sure that happened properly. Yes, there it is right there. So there's the edited one and there's the original one. So, um, okay, I'm just gonna switch over to the digital apps just to show you what that looks like. And then we'll jump onto the desktop uh, to see um, how these images are edited. So I'm just using a little trick here, QuickTime, to show my phone. So here is Here on my phone, I have these two apps. I have a few apps that are, um, one of the apps that I use in my courses, uh, but the two that I want you to focus on here is Capture and Lightroom. So let's take a quick look at Capture first and then we'll jump over to uh, Lightroom. So um, the, uh, the part of the app that I wanted you to pay attention to is this one called Colors. So uh, when you first start up, uh, you probably won't see something like this because you won't have anything saved, but uh, you can save a lot of, you can capture a lot of different information in, like, in um, Capture. And one of the things that's pretty cool is you can capture colors. So I use this when I go to art galleries. I want to pay, pay close attention to the colors that an artist has used. Um, this one presents particular challenges because um, I was shooting outside, but uh, colors outside uh, degrade quite a bit. So these poles were completed in 1961. So that means that colors have been subject to uh, sunlight and rain for decades, and they've lost a lot of their original vibrancy. Um, but just, we won't worry about that too much right now. But what, what I want you to do is more learn how to use the tool. So here you can see this is a uh, a set of postcards by uh, Jessica Hirsch. Uh, very beautiful letters. Um, each postcard is a letter and I send them once in a while to people, not as much as I should. Um, but if you look at here at what this looks like, so what I did is I just clicked on the photo button. And so here, just this blue button in the bottom right, just click on the photo. And what that does is you can see right away that Capture is trying to choose which are the important images inside the frame. And you know what? If I'm sitting on a, if I have this on a white background, this might be a little more effective than on a color background. So in an art gallery, it's gonna tend to be to choose better colors. But here, you know, on my desktop, not as accurate, not as, it's a, it gets distracted by the other colors. Okay, so I'm not sure what's going on here. Let's see. Okay, so still choosing the white paper, but that's okay, because what you do, all you have to do is touch the screen and it'll freeze it. And then you can tell, capture, no, I actually wanted this green I want this yellow, I want this red, and maybe I want this, so I already have the pink, I want the red, and you know what, um, maybe there's not any more colors that she uses in here, that's it. 
but the black is part of it, right? This is part of the color scheme. So now I have chosen these colors. The image doesn't look great, but that's okay because I'm not actually, it, Capture will take a photo as well, but what I'm trying to get here is the, is the colors. So it's gonna click the um, check mark. And here you can see I can make adjustments to these colors. So you know what, if I feel that, you know what, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna capture, there's another color in here that actually would be useful to have. Because I have, I already have this, the lighter yellow, but she uses a darker yellow there. And I think it's important to capture that one as well. And you can see right away what's happening is when I'm trying to capture a photo, uh, what tends to happen is I spend a lot of time looking at what's in the viewfinder. But if I'm focusing on the colors, I pay more attention to what colors the artist has used. And this is, you know, a small set of colors, there's only five, but you can get a good sense for what was important there. And here, you know, again, I can go here and I can make adjustments to these if I, if I want to, um, but I'm not gonna make adjustments right now. Uh, there's some interesting things you can do with harmonies. Um, Here's the image again. I want to make some changes, and I'm going to go ahead and click Save. And you can spend. You, I did a few of these when I was looking at the totems, and I'd recommend that you do the same too when you're capturing colors. You can actually capture a whole bunch of color schemes, even from the same piece. So you know, especially if you're outdoors, those colors will change with the light a lot. So as the light moved around to the front of the totems, I wasn't there anymore. But if I had stayed around, I could have captured a different set of colors uh, when the light changed. And I am going to um, call this uh, Jess. Jess Jessica Hirsch. And here, this is important. So keeping track of what where you got the images from or the colors come becomes very important because it is really hard to tell where those what those colors where you got those colors from later when you have a whole bunch of them so it's very useful to when if you need to go back and try and find them and you're trying to remember what was those colors okay so Jessica Hirsch and this is her 100 drop Caps, postcards, and uh, I'm just going to credit the publisher here. So, postcards, and this is from Chronicle Books. And see, one thing that I didn't show you, and that was, I'm saving to a library. Uh, and so um, this, I have a bunch of libraries that I've set up. These are easier to set up on your desktop than on your phone, but you can do them here as well. So here you can see under the GD157 library, um, I have quite a few color selections from previous projects. Uh, that I've used, and here is the ones from the Totem Project, so uh, Susan Point, I have collected a few of those, and I collected uh, three from Bill Reed and Douglas Kramer. That is Capture. Um, okay, so before we switch back to the desktop, I'm going to look at a couple of things here uh, for with Lightroom, with Lightroom. So again, Lightroom, another desktop app. Uh, unlike Capture, Lightroom has a app also on the desktop. And this is where the real power is, is that you can switch back and forth. Um, uh, we have a professional photographer in our class and he uses Lightroom because it is because of the workflow between your mobile and the app. It's just so seamless. It's amazing. Uh, so uh, I just want to point out one thing here on the mobile app, and then I'm going to jump on to Lightroom on the desktop. 
So when you're taking a photo with Lightroom, what you're going to do is you're going to um, you're going to click on this camera button here. So when you're on anywhere in Lightroom, click on this uh, camera app. And what you want to make sure you're doing is you're shooting through the front camera and you're using DNG. So DNG is Adobe's, um, you guys are seeing my desktop here. This is my B box. This is what um, our, my B colony came in. Um, anyways, uh, DNG is a, uh, is a raw format. So raw format is super important for photographers. So you guys are gonna do some uh, workflow work in this class as part of learning outcome and working with raw super powerful i just reached out to a to a photographer and asked her for some really really large copies of some product shots that she'd done for me two years ago and so she saves all these raw is like negatives so for those of you who have shot uh, uh, photographs using film you know you get these negatives that you can make many many prints from so you can always go back to the negatives raw is a little bit more than that and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in class but i just want to make sure that when you're shooting next week um, using your phone so you're going to go around and shoot things again asking making sure you get um, permission you're going to be shooting things shooting things around the office shooting you know you know there will be sensitive documents so again i can't emphasize more make sure you get permission be shooting you know a photo of the person whose career you're going to be uh, describing shooting pictures of tools so these are my picks from my banjo whatever this person has in their workspace um you know if you're if it's a fire axe or a or a, <laughs> a, a fire truck Whatever it is that you're photographing, make sure that you use Lightroom RAW because that is going to give you lots of opportunity to do editing later. All right, so um, that's what I did. I shot using Lightroom and here you can see that these images appear in here and uh, they appear here right away and I'm going to show you what they look like when you're on the uh, desktop. So this is what Lightroom looks like on the desktop. And just a quick introduction to what things look like. Um, it'll just load the images in here, all of them. Because it's going through the cloud, it does a couple of things that are really, really powerful. And one of them is, is that you know, it's scary, but also very powerful. Before we used to, and if you do this using any like non-cloud workflow, you have to do this manually. You have to sort your photos into folders. Uh, you have to add keywords to it so you can find them later because you can end up with a lot of photos. But here's what uh, the AI in um, Lightroom does. Uh, what, when when you're, this is one of the things that it does, which is really powerful, is it analyzes the images and basically adds keywords to them. So it it knows what's in there. So if I type in, and I have not added any keywords. So this is just Lightroom analyzing the images and it recognizes totems. I try to enter other things like Haida. No, <laughs> it just recognizes. The word totem. Uh, it'll also recognize like material, so it'll recognize wood. So you can see this grabbing all of the images where it sees that the texture is wood, all the ones in my library, it'll grab them all. So pretty powerful. Um, you know, can type in a name of a material, can type in, you know, a, you know, a face. So face, it'll find all the faces. Uh, these are all kind of school projects I did, but you see here, which is interesting, when I type in faces, typed in all the crazy faces that I have done, but it also finds the totems. 
because there is faces in the totems. So that's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. Um, all right, so that's the IA that is both scary and amazing. Uh, what I do is I do actually organize it, so I create a <clears throat> a folder for my an, uh, folder for the class, and then I create an album inside there for each project. Uh, so that is uh, that's useful just for later when you're starting to come up with short lists and stuff. Okay, so this part is optional. So you can. Um, you can just go ahead and organize your photos and put them up onto your Meyer board, or you can spend a little bit of time here and learn a little bit about, about Lightroom and because you're going to be doing it later anyways. So you might as well pick up on that if you're going to start learning early. So um, just want to show you two things here that you can do with your photos that can really, you know, in a, you can, in really small way, you can improve the photo uh, um, just by uh, thinking about how we see things as humans. So as, as humans, when we look at an image, so when I'm standing at the Museum of Anthropology, you can see here that what the camera has done is it, is, is it has distorted the image. So when I look at this image and I look here at the sky and then my eye moves here to the center, my eyes adjust for that change in light. When you take a photo, it doesn't necessarily do that. So it, a, a photograph is one exposure for the whole image. But when I'm seeing it as a human and I'm in that space, I can, you know, when I move around, my eyes adjust automatically. So that means that the subject may not necessarily be exposed the way that I would see it when I'm there in person. And I just want to add one thing is if you do did shoot your photos um, in just your camera app on your phone, uh, you can actually bring them into Lightroom here by just clicking on the add photos button. So that will allow you to find the photos on your computer and upload them. So if you didn't shoot in Lightroom and there's nothing in here, just go ahead and add your photos and you put this video on pause and come back once you have them uploaded. Let me take a few minutes. Okay, all right, so what I want to do is I want to show you a couple things here. One is how you can edit these image to make images to make them to make the details clear because really that's what you want to do is you want to try and bring it back to what the experience was like when you were on location in this space. You know, the lighting is in an art gallery, it tends to be very controlled. Outdoors, the lighting is much more variable and you know clouds come and go by and your eye is moving around between this bright sky and the you know the sh in, in this case when i shot these the clouds were uh, the sun was behind the totems i didn't have time to wait until the afternoon where the lighting would have been better so i had to shoot what was there and it's not ideal so um Lightroom is a, allows you to make some really small changes really quickly that can improve what the images look like. So um, again, here you have all your uh, information about the how Lightroom has organized your photos. And over here on the left-hand side, there's some tools that allow you to do these kind of quick edits. So this first one, super powerful. What it does is it has a ton of controls that allow you to edit all these different aspects of your image. A uh, little bit daunting, you can, you can get lost very quickly if you're not used to these controls. Uh, this button here is super useful, right there, this auto button. allows you to quickly enhance the image. And what is really cool about this is that all this information is only tags. When you apply these adjustments to your image, it doesn't change your image at all. So if you're shooting raw, all those, that original information is saved. You can always go back to the original raw file. Uh, what it does is it just basically says, okay, Andrew said that he wants this a little bit, a little, little bit more contrast, right? So I'm just gonna go back to the original so you can see what it looked like when I first shot it. So you can see that it was 
the most important part of the image, so far as I'm concerned, is not the setting that it's in, but is actually the artwork that the artist created here. And you can see that the contrast is very low. It makes it hard to see the details in it. The texture in the wood is not as like intense as it is when I'm there in person. I'm just like, the amount of erosion and the narrative that that adds to the image is incredible. And I really lose that here in the shot. You know, and part of it is I'm just not that good of a good of a photographer. I didn't. I don't have the best equipment. I don't have a good camera on my phone, and it just does not take good him get good photos. But here you can see this is the original. It's always saved, and these other ones are are only all they are is it's a tag. It's a bunch of tags that Lightroom adds to the image. I can always go back to this original. So again, if I start with the original and I just click on auto, right away that makes a huge improvement to this image. I can see the details a lot better. Um, I can actually start to see this image down here, which is an important part of the image. This, this particular part of the totem, these characters, is called grizzly bear with a human child. And you can see here underneath the claws on the bear. So this is the arm of the bear and the claws and I love this graphic language, it's so beautiful. This tongue that sticks out. There's a couple of angles, other angles that I shot that are just like, I, I love these pieces that Bill Reed and uh, Douglas Kramer created. Um, it's behind the Museum, Museum, of Museum of Anthropology, so it's free to go see. You can go there anytime and very beautiful. But anyways, coming back to this image, how do we make these adjustments? This is a really nice first step, Auto. Okay, I'm gonna deselect auto and go here. And you can see that um, I go here. These, these tools have not been applied. So you can see some that have switched, but that's just because that, that's the original setting on the camera. But these sliders have not been applied. As soon as I click auto, you can see that all Lightroom is saying, okay, change the highlights to this, change the shadow to this setting, like like remove this much of the, the light exposure from the highlights and add this much to the shadows. It's just moving those around, that's all this does. Again, if I have to go and do this myself, I'm gonna get lost pretty quickly. I don't spend a ton of time in Lightroom, um, so it can be pretty easy for me to get lost. Uh, you know, I can always go back to the original, and if I if I just scrub over it again, this is down here under versions. So you just click on versions, and it'll tell you what you've done. Uh, so this is using auto. The other thing that can make it is a nice, like low hanging fruit, and it's you know again a good place to start. So from here, I can go in and say, well, actually maybe, you know, maybe I do want some more highlights in here. Maybe I do want to reduce the highlights a little bit more. You can see I'll start to change it. And if I ever want to go back to zero, I just double click there. All you do is just double click on these and it'll bring it back to zero. So these controls are set up to make it really easy for you to start in a good spot and then make your own adjustments. If I click here on presets, Uh, one thing, so there's a whole, there are a whole bunch of presets. So here's presets that I've used. Here's premium presets. But the recommended ones are a good place to start because what uh, Lightroom does is it analyzes the image and then it's, it goes through and it says, okay, well, based on what I can see in this image, some of these may help, may actually be nice enhancements to the image. So here's where we were just after hitting auto. And then if I go here, you can see what, you know, sometimes Lightroom is just really far off and sometimes they find something that it actually can work really well. So here you can see that the, you know, I don't really, this coolness to it, it's a very warm, warm material. It's red cedar, um, so I don't really want that. Uh, this is, you know, definitely too much, right? <laughs> like I don't want to exaggerate it. I want it to feel as close as possible to what I remember that I felt like when I was there. So doing this, you know, right when you come back can be really, you know, come back from your field work. It might be a good time to make these kind of edits to your image. So, um, 
you know, I like the contrast that this brings into it. So it really, you really get a good sense for the, for the shapes and the depth that was created in the image. Um, this actually displays quite a bit of the image. It's actually uh, really reveals a lot of what uh, is lost because of the time of day that I shot. Uh, one thing that happens is this area here around the eyes is actually quite blue. It's very, um, it's lost a lot of the color because of, you know, the decades that have been sitting outside, but there was quite a bit of blue in here. And I think it's, you know, pretty close to what was in the sky. So, you know, that blue is probably more accurate, but it's a bit of a toss up. You have to choose what you think is most important. Here, I, I see the blue coming back in here. So I really like this, this one, the way it looks. It's a little bit exaggerated. And you know what, if you want to make it a little more realistic, you can just pull back on the preset and find something, you know, a little bit closer. It doesn't look so exaggerated, but still looks quite a bit better than where, um, where I was when, uh, when I just brought the images into here. Still, it looks quite a bit better. And it's interesting how you can actually make these adjustments on your phone in Lightroom when you're standing in front of the image. So this can be a good place to do that as well. Um, you know, this can be hard with the glare of the sun on your screen, but if you're inside a gallery, it can be a good place to make those adjustments. So um, if you really like what you found, what I suggest that you do is you go here to named and you create a version. So you just click on create a version and um, you can call it, you know, adjusted for detail and contrast. Contrast, whatever helps you like, like remember what this is. I don't have a good system for what to name these versions, but as you work on it, you'll start to realize that there's certain things that you look for when you look at these versions and maybe this is one of them. So I'm gonna go ahead and create that. And here you can see, this is the original and this is where we ended up. So small changes, but you can see how much detail is now really visible in the image and how much clearer it is before, right? Before it was all this contrast here between the sky and the, and the totem. And now we actually can see quite a bit of contrast and detail in the image itself and the character of the grizzly bear and even a little bit of the human child underneath. So, you know, I did that to a few of them. You can see here, I'll show you a couple of them. So this one here, you know, it does feel very exaggerated, but I wanted to make sure that it was really visible in the space, like really how it felt when I was there. And it is a very striking image. This is a mortuary pole. So that means with these poles, they weren't set up next to the house, um, the Haida house in the village. These stood outside. And there was a very prominent figure in that house. Their remains were stored after their, 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 their death, their remains were stored in a box up here on top of the pole. Um, so I'm, I adjusted this one for drama. So adjusted for drama. here you recognize right underneath here is our grizzly bear with the human child underneath and so these figures these characters here in these poles uh, tell again they tell the story of lineage of accomplishments um, and they're using this graph this vocabulary this graphic language that the Haida nation like developed over millennia so um, very advanced graphic language. One thing that this does too, is it brings out this totem that's in the background. So the placement of these totems became important because they were arranged in certain ways within the village. So this is what the village looked like on Haida Gwaii. So you can see how there was these um, houses, each for prominent families with these totems in front, mortuary poles in front of those, and very um, 
very rich culture. Uh, you know, smallpox decimated these villages, and they're still there. So, um, I think it's been over a hundred years. They're still standing there, uh, but they're in. The, they're very eroded, right? So, if you get a chance to go up to Haida Gwaii, it is a spectacular place to go. And this is the recreation at uh, Museum of Anthropology at UBC. So these ones were carved. Most of them were carved by Bill Reed and Douglas Kramer. There. This is one of the plaques in front of the, the totems. So again, I've gone through and I've edited a bunch of these. So this is one of my favorites one, favorite ones. If I go here to versions, you can see here what the original looked like and what this one looked like. So this one was a small adjustment, but it really brought out some of the detail in, this, in the side of the face. I love the way this tongue sticks out. It's so, uh, it's like this smile, this incredible smile on the bear. Anyways, I love this one. Once you're done this, you're gonna select the images that you wanna export. So here, I'm just gonna go ahead and select. I didn't select all of them. Uh, okay. And then you're just gonna go to File, Export. And this will bring up a screen when you, where you can choose how to name them. Um, it's easiest if you name them all the same. I did full-size JPEGs and you know it reduced the quality slightly uh, just to save on uh, file space. And when you click on export, you're gonna choose where to export. And this is where I created those folders so just I'll show you where that happens. Here I created these folders under images. So under images, Bill Reed, I just took on new folder and gave it the name. And then I placed them inside of there just to keep it a little more organized. I'm not gonna redo that. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and click cancel. So I'm gonna hide Lightroom. And here are the images that I exported from a Lightroom. If you didn't use Lightroom, you still would have your images organized here. And now I wanna take a minute to show you how I want you to save, to convert your color samples in Illustrator. So here's one of them. Um, you can see here that there's two artboards, one on top of each other. So I have this artboard here, so, and this artboard here. So this artboard is a little artboard. That is, and I grab my artboard tool, I can take it and I can drag it over here. It's one artboard that's sitting on top of the other one. And to simplify these, this, I think I'm going to, um, yeah, I'll just leave it like this, that's fine. With the next one, I'll show you how I did that. But what I'm gonna do is, I am going to, uh, I'm gonna make a copy of this larger artboard. So just, again, I have my artboard tool, clicked on this mortuary pool. So this artboard here that has the image and all you're gonna export is these swatches. So with this artboard selected, I go here to my artboards palette and I go duplicate artboards. And you are gonna be starting from, not from this duplicate one, but you're just gonna create a artboard that is, okay, I added another one, but that's okay. That's not an artboard, that was just an outline. So you're gonna start with one that is, eight and a half by 11. So here, when you go, when you start here, actually, why don't I do that? Why don't I go start from the beginning with you just to make it easier? So I'm gonna go new file, letter size. Okay, and here it depends on the orientation of your image, um, how you wanna do this. Actually, it doesn't matter either way. With this one, it doesn't matter because really all you're focusing on is those swatches. So I'm gonna go ahead and create one. And I'm going to do one of Susan Points because I haven't done that one yet. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go File, 
place. I go to images, Susan Point, and I'm going to just scroll through these till I find the one I want. this one here and I'm going to go ahead and place it. So this is again a it's quite different from the Haida totem poles in that um, what Susan Point did is Susan Point did is she created um, they're not very traditional, so just like Bill Reed, not, you know, she's advancing the art form. She's not, it's not been locked in to this very traditional way of doing the art form. But these posts, let's see if I can show you here. These posts were actually posts that held up the beams to the house. And you can see here that this post is actually facing inside the house. So unlike the Haida posts that faced outside and they were like her heraldry and showing you know the lineage and these great stories of like great people within that family these were facing inside and the meaning the meaning of the, the design was facing inside wasn't known publicly so you could if you came into the house you could see it you may not necessarily know what it meant unless the family members trusted you and confided in you what that meant it wasn't a public display it was private so quite different. Uh, the, the purpose of this poll was quite different. In, in the Haida culture, in the Haida like, tradition, the poles were facing outside. Uh, yes, they could support the house, but they tended to be outside and more um, this public heraldry. So the purpose of it was to tell the story of the, um, of the family. Uh, the, Musqueam tradition was quite different and it was actually inside it was more a private story okay so um, these were uh, you can see right away that what I've done here is I mean if I really wanted to make it full frame I would uh, or reorient the page it's probably not a bad thing to do let's I'm gonna go ahead and do that I'm going to change the orientation of this because I want to just briefly talk about this idea of bleed. So you can, uh, I know I introduced this on the first class. So this red line around your artboard is called bleed. And the reason why we use bleed is because when we print images, if we want to print right to the edge of the page, when we print, we actually have to pick, print past the edge. And we print past the edge, we print on a larger sheet, and then trim it. And that's the only way to get an image that's printed in a you know professional printing press to print right to the edge and a little bit past. And that's why it's actually important when you shoot images for a campaign, for a you know a professional project or a personal project, it's important to imagine when you're shooting it to shoot your photos bigger than what you need. So if you're shooting product shots, shoot with lots of white space, or white space around it. It's this continuous argument between product photographers and designers is to give me more white space around it so I can shoot my images. So I can crop my images, right? I can adjust it to the layout. Um, but when you're shooting, when you're printing full bleed, what you're gonna do is you're going to need to uh, expand the image past the edge of the page and then, and then when it gets printed on the larger sheet, it gets trimmed. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a clipping mask to show you what that looks like when you're printing right to the edge. So this prints right to the bleed. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and save this. Save as. Again, I'm gonna save it to my computer. And I'm gonna save it here under Susan Point. So I'm going to call this, let's see, did I put it here, right here, um, 
Yes. I'm going to call this here my exercise. So my name, the date, the name of the exercise, and where. But I'm going to call this two because I've already done one of them. And I'm going to go ahead and save it. Again, you're not going to submit this. This is just a tiny bit of practice. I want to make sure that you're practicing the things that you learned so that you can continue to hold on to that knowledge. The next thing I want you to do is, okay, next thing I want you to do is what Capture did is Capture saved your colors to your library. And you can see I've opened up the library palette here. I'm going to drag this out because this is what we did last class. And I'm going to go here and I am going to open my libraries. Uh, I'm going to take this tab and drag it into here. And I'm going to save this workspace. So a new workspace, GD157. And, you know, capitalization is important here. The spacing is important. You're going to want to always save over this. So you want to keep updating this workspace so that your workspace looks the same as mine. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. Okay, so what, um, what Capture did is it took that color scheme that I shot at the Museum of, Anthropo and Museum of Anthropology and saved it as an object in my libraries. And because I saved it here to GD157, it's stored there. Um, but one place where it shows up here is under libraries in Photoshop and Illustrator. And so what I've done is I've created a folder for different clients here. Um, this GD157 is all things that I've created for this course. So you can create a new library by clicking on create new library, and then it allows you to create a library and name it. And I suggest that you do that and that you store the information that you accumulate in this class, the library information, into there. If I open this here, you can see here that naming my color, uh, the color schemes that I saved carefully uh, helps me find them later. So uh, here you can see I saved a couple from um, of Susan Points. So I'm going to go ahead and open one of them. I'm going to grab this one here. And here you can see that um, if I hover over it, it allows me to select these individual colors here. Uh, I can also right click on it and I can add these, this theme to my swatches. So um, I'm going to do that, but it's not, you know, not necessary for this, this assignment but I can go ahead and go add this theme to my swatches. And now if I go to my swatches palette, uh, you'll see here that it added a folder with swatches to my color swatches. So Susan Point, there's now some swatches there. Um, you're probably gonna make some adjustments to your swatches. Uh, so I wouldn't do that at this point, but I'm, you will do it later in this course. So what I'm going to do is I am going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create five squares. So just like you've done before, uh, you're going to create a square, uh, holding down your shift key to constrain it. I'm going to switch over to my uh, selection tool by just clicking the V key on my keyboard. So that's the hot key. And I'm going to click and as I'm dragging, not before, as I'm dragging, I'm going to hit the shift key to constrain it, and I'm going to hit the option key to copy it. And, okay, before I do that, <laughs> I'm going to give it a color so I can see it. So the way I can color it, so make sure that your fill is in the front, not your, not your stroke. Make sure the fill is in the front, and you just click on one of these colors here. So you can click on any of them here to create this color. So what I'm going to do now that I have a, given a color to the swatch, I'm going to click and drag down. So again, you know, a couple of you had challenges around this. I think I'm showing it a little bit better each time I do it. Um, but any feedback that you give me is helpful. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click and drag. And as I'm dragging, hold the shift key down and the option key. And what that does is it changes the cursor. If I let go of my option key before I let go of the keyboard, it's going to move it. Likewise, if I hold my shift key down first, it's going to deselect it. So you just have to do it a little slightly different order and you're not going to have to think about this forever. Once you have done it 10 times, maybe some people a few more, once you've done it like 10 times, it will be second nature. It'll be a muscle memory. You won't even think about it anymore. I have a hard time showing people how to do it because I don't think about it. I've been doing it for so long that I don't think about it. So select, click. Okay. Again, I'm in isolation mode. I'm gonna get out of isolation mode. Select, click, and drag. Hold the shift key down, option key. Just a little space in between, let go. I can apply the color and then Command D. New color, Command D. New color, Command D. And the final color. And there I have the colors that I sampled on site. Um, so one thing that you'll notice, I didn't spend a lot of time adjusting the colors when I was on site because uh, there actually a group came right when I was there and I was standing right in front of the piece while the guide was trying to talk about it and so I just took the photo and walked away so I grabbed the color scheme and walked away um, I did listen to what she had to say because it's very interesting but what I can do now is I can select one of these and I can go over here to my eyedropper tool because you can see here there's actually no green in the artwork the green that capture grabbed was from the trees so what I want to do is I what think one color that's missing from here is there is this blue that's missing and it's an important part of the artwork is something that there's a few things captured didn't capture here <laughs> and one of them was that um, it didn't capture the blue. So I want to make sure I actually capture a couple of different blues, one a little bit lighter one. So what I can do is I can just click and click and, and what it's going to do is it's actually grabbing a very small sample of it. So here you can see when I zoom in, I have more control over where I'm sampling from. And I just want to grab one that feels indicative of that color. So, and you can, you know, make sure they're adjacent grab as many as you want so you know what capture is only going to grab this many maybe I want a couple of blues so again I can just drag this out go getting it to my my eyedropper tool and maybe grab a lighter or a darker blue I think I already have a very light color light blue yes I do so maybe I want something a little bit darker okay um, uh, it grabbed this red here, so that's good. So I'm gonna put these side by side. You know, again, just as long as you're organizing it and you're thinking about it. That's the important thing. I'm not gonna, everybody's artwork is really different. So if you're taking the time to really look at the image and look at the colors, that's the important part. So again, I may wanna make a little adjustment to this color here. So you can see this color, she uses color in two places, here on these dots on each side and in the lips. You know, the color is more prominent and I'm going to grab a bit of a range here just because I want to make sure that I'm paying attention to you know how the color changes with light. Okay uh, another one that's missing is the the yellow. So she used the yellow here uh, that's a little bit washed out. This one might be a little bit more accurate so we have that yellow. This yellow is just from the sunlight. It's not as important. Um, I'm gonna actually recolor this one. So I'm gonna take this one and I'm gonna sample some of these wood colors here. Uh, obviously the color of the wood, super important for the piece. Um, I'm gonna take a lighter one as well. 
flip these around. I shouldn't have done that, but I'm going to put the lighter one on this side. Okay, and I'm going to grab this darker color here. Pretty sure these are some sort of sea serpent. So this is a way to really pay attention to the colors and you know what I've the colors are not copyright you can actually <laughs> the naming of colors can be copyright there's only a couple of colors in the world that are copyright and um, most colors you are free to use so um, I think you know be able to talk about where you got them super you know super beautiful color combinations uh, you know what, that's artistic choice. And I think it makes a lot of sense to attribute those, like where you got them from, as opposed to just like, you know, you don't go up to Mondrian, take the colors, go home and do a painting and say, you know, these are my colors. Being able to say that this is based on a, like a Theo van Duisburg or like whatever artist that you got it from is pretty powerful. It can really elevate your work to be able to say, these colors are based on uh, this other artist. Susan Point actually, she's explicit. She based the designs of this. She was inspired by some um, house posts that are in the Museum of Natural History in New York. Okay, so you're going to create an artboard for this. So with this selected, so you can see here that these swatches are selected. What I can do, this is a nice little shortcut, I can just click on them and it'll add an artboard. And you can see it just added an artboard for one of them. I can just take it and drag it down. And I may want to add a little bit of room around it just so that uh, it is, and because I haven't measured it, I'm just going to do it by eye. But you know what, margins can really add to the integrity of everything that you do. So I'm going to just add a little bit of room around this. I'm going to name my artboards. I'm going to go here and I'm going to call this one. I'm just going to call this one the uh, doorpost. And I'm going to call this one the color swatches. Um, the only one you're going to need to export is this one here. I don't know why this one shifted. Maybe you guys saw this happen. But color. Save it and then just export this. So to do that, we just go file, save as a copy. And I'm going to actually put this one right in the images folder here. And I'm just going to call it color swatches at this point. So color swatches. If you have more than one, uh, it be super good practice to try these things. So I'm going to save this one as a PDF. Again, I'm placing this on a Myra board. But even if I was submitting uh, in Blackboard, I have to make sure you submit PDFs. So, and this is, here you can see that this is artboard number two. And I'm gonna go ahead and save it. Again, if you've saved a preset, great. If you haven't, this could be a good time to create one. So custom and custom, oh yeah. So this one is called uh, GD157 submission. Uh, you can see here that all this stuff is preserved. Just click here and give it a name. So if you haven't created one yet, just click on this little icon here and call it GD157 submission. And that's gonna save you a lot of time. 
again it does the same thing as the workspace you just save over it every time so I'm going to go ahead and click save PDF and here you can see I have a PDF now with my color swatches okay show you one more thing and then we're going to jump into Miro and do the final um, uh, layout of your images and that's this tool here called Grammarly uh, you guys may have noticed that my spelling is not incredible I do pay attention to it and I've worked on it really hard but I do misspell things quite a bit and I think at the pace that we work in this modern world this is going to happen a lot so take the time to use a tool like this to organize your information if you're using notepad that's great but it doesn't do some of the things that Grammarly does with helping you with um, with the grammar if you really struggle with grammar I suggest you buy the premium version because it'll really help you improve um, I'm just too cheap to get subs too many subscriptions but uh, what you don't want is you don't want uh, typos and spelling mistakes to get in the way of your content so when I look at your work I want to pay attention to what you've written and and you know the images the content that you've created I don't want to be distracted by spelling mistakes so please take the time to just paste your copy into uh, a tool like Grammarly and and that will help you to organize it so here you can see I've organized everything in here I have both my submissions I have the name of the artist I have the year that it was made I have what it is here's this extra data that's important and the Museum of Anthropology at UBC where so who when what and where and I have the location so where the totems where I found the totems what the size was the materials so totems are red cedar what the purpose of it was and the same with the piece from Susan Point so Susan Point the year it was created the house posts that they're Musqueam uh, Museum of Anthropology at UBC so this is the nation that she identifies with the location so the house posts are along a path behind so it leads behind the Museum of Anthropology down towards Rick Beach if you go to the Museum of Anthropology and you're comfortable with seeing naked people go to Rec Beach it's a beautiful beach and the walk down there it's um, some of the stairs go through old growth stands of forest it's not an old growth forest it is a stand of old growth it's never been logged and so it's very beautiful um, so traditionally these posts were situated inside inside the house not displayed publicly uh, this is the size so this is in meters uh, and this I grabbed from the website the material is cedar wood and here's a description of the purpose so it was not this public display it was this private story that they told so I'm just going to switch over to Miro and finish up what we're doing so this layout is up to you I just want you to make sure that it's well organized and it's clear so one of the things that you're going to do and this again is extra credit if you did edit your photos in Lightroom post the original small and then right beside it the one that you edited and that way I'll know that you were looking for extra credit and that you know depending on how much work you did you can get a and you know whether or not you did everything really in this in these kind of assignments exercises it is the amount of work you do um, yes quality is important but and quality will be evident in the work that you do so obviously this is a higher quality image than this one and you know it's a very accessible tool so taking the time to learn it really that's a learning outcome for this course so I will give you credit for that uh, this here is the color swatch and really I am you know the, again the organization is up to you but the hierarchy is important so this is the this is was my favorite image that I shot this is the least important even though me going there is a very important act of acknowledgement so what I could do here you know 
There's this title page. The size of the frames is up to you. You can just go ahead and place your images in there. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go to my finder and I'm just gonna grab all this and I can delete it later. So I can just grab all these images. I'm just gonna grab these images here. Grabbing the wrong thing. Okay. So confusing. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna grab these and I'm just gonna place them on the Myra board. And I'm gonna delete some of them because they weren't uh, that useful. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna copy and paste it just so that I can have the same size board. And then I'm gonna delete all of this, except I'm gonna keep this. And I'm gonna drag this down here. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna to go to my Grammarly and I'm just gonna take this attribution here. And this is what I'm gonna name my board except I'm going to keep this here. So exercise 4.3, that just helps me keep my boards organized because I have a lot of boards. So this is called exercise one here. So this is, would be your name. And then this next one is just called, you know, this one is the full name of the assignment. This one here is really getting into the detail of what this board is about. And so exercise 4.2, 4 4.3. So you'll have, you know, if you decide to organize it this way, you will have three boards, a title, a title page or a title frame. You know, again, these aren't boards, that's Illustrator, but you'll have a title frame and then you'll have um, your, Two boards, one for each artist. Okay. Um, this is the full frame shot, so you need to include a full frame shot. Uh, I'm going to include both of these because this is one that I've edited. Um, not going to include this one, and I'm not going to include this one. And I like this one, so I'll include this one too. Because this one really shows the colors in here. This is actually my favorite one out of the shots here, even though I love this piece here. This one I drew for, I spent quite a bit of time drawing this one for an assignment for my 101 class. Okay. In 101, the students had to draw, do multiple drawings of multiple pieces. So they took them supposedly quite a bit more time. If you get a chance to draw when you go there, do it. Okay, so just thinking about the hierarchy, this is not as important an image, so I'm gonna make it really small. Because I've aligned my frames, uh, sometimes what these applications will do is they'll allow you to align things with other, see how you get those alignment, and then you can keep your boards looking kind of similar. Um, but I may or may not want to keep them that way, right? I may want to actually change the scale with each board. And again, Miro doesn't give you as uh, Miro does not give you as many tools to um, as precise tools as an illustrator. So this one again, this is the one that I edited. So this one I'm putting on here because with this one, I edit, edited the geometry. Um, so that's one thing I didn't show you in the Lightroom exercise. So I'm just gonna switch back to that one quickly. And if you decided not to edit your images in Lightroom, don't worry about it. I'm just gonna switch back here to Lightroom and I'll show you how to do that here. So it's pretty cool how you can do this. Uh, this is. I know there's different tools that do this, but the one in, this one in Lightroom is actually pretty good. So you see with this image, 
is that uh, Lightroom, uh, I mean, when I shot it, the camera's actually distorting it. We don't actually see, perceive an image to be this way. We actually perceive it to be, you know, have square angles. Um, perspective is something that we see, but it's mostly something we perceive. It really affects how we perceive something, and it is largely a Western idea. Um, when we look at an image out there, we don't really pay attention to perspective lines unless we're really drawing that way. So being able to correct the geometry on an image is actually a very powerful thing to be able to do when you're studying it. So uh, this is a fairly flat image, so it can work if there's a lot of dimension in it. Um, then it can actually be confusing. <laughs> but, you know, especially if you're shooting a building, the front of a building, you know, looking up at it, that perspective is not really the way that we see the building. So what you can do here in Lightroom, again, this is something you can do pretty quickly. You go down, so under your uh, editing tools here on the side, the very bottom, so if you collapse everything, is this thing called geometry. And you can actually grab these guides here. And you may not want to straighten it 100%. You may want to leave a little bit of perspective in there, but if you fix it a little bit, it can actually make a really big difference for, you know, because when we see this thing in real life, we understand that it's this beam that's just straight all the way to the top. It's a huge piece of wood. I don't know how they milled those things without the, you know, like the power, the power tools that we have now. So that starts to feel a little bit more. It's still twisted. You can see here that, you know, again, there was a group that arrived right when I was shooting it, so I had to hurry. But uh, you can do it four ways in, I mean, you, you can use four guides in Lightroom. So this allows me to correct. And you can see here that I can make adjustments to either increase or decrease it. Okay. I'm going to add this one. The vertical position of this, I can control it quite a bit. Um, but also the horizontal. So here I can grab this. And you can see here, I'm just lining it up with the angle that showed up here. And then I can do this at the bottom as well. And what Lightroom is going to do is uh, it only starts doing it after you've put in your second guide. But it's going to adjust the angles of the image to kind of correct that. So you can see all of a sudden this starts to feel very square what it didn't feel like before. And um, again, you know, nothing has been edited here. It's not like, I mean, I shouldn't say nothing has been edited. There's been some editing here, but nothing has changed in your original image. It looks like it, uh, Lightroom has distorted your image. It hasn't, your original image is here. Under versions, I'm gonna go to create a version and I'm gonna call it um, geometry corrected. You can see here that the original is still here. All it did was add some tags to the image. The amount of file space that it takes is minimal. It doesn't really do that much to it. Okay, so I'm going to leave that here like that. I'm going to hide Lightroom and I'm going to go back here. I just wanted to show you what that looks like. Um, there is one thing you can do in, in Miro um, is you can actually uh, go and crop this and it allows you to do the same thing as with Illustrator where if you hold the option key down it'll crop from the center so it'll do both sides at the same time. Um, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that here because I want to see that you did the work to do some geometry correction if you had an image where you wanted to do that. And I'm going to go to places here, and this is the one that's not corrected, so I'm going to make it really small, and that just is going to it's going to it's going to be this little flag for me when I look at your work. It'll be like, Andrew, pay attention to this. I did extra work. I learned how to use a tool, 
give me credit for it, great. I'm more than happy to do that. So again, with this one, this one I edited as well, but I don't have a copy of the original. Um, so I'm just going to pretend that this is the original. And you know what? If you have an image that looks really awesome, like I think this one does, make it really big. Like let it take up the whole page. And you can be really proud of that. Um, and just drag those out. Uh, the one thing that you need to add here is your swatches. So I'll show you how you can do that afterwards. But the, um, uh, you're gonna need to add the text. And here's where I think you can keep it really simple. So you just go over to your Grammarly, select all your text here. So copy, switch back to Miro, select all, and paste. Okay, just make sure that you, okay, let's take a minute to do this a little bit smarter. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take this again, paste, and all that happened was I just don't have to do less bolding. So unfortunately, Grammarly doesn't allow you, I mean, Miro doesn't allow you to change the size of part of a text object. So you can just keep it all small and just bold this as the title. So Command B. And that's it. Here you have the information that you gathered. Nice little study. The only thing we have to add still is the swatches. So here we have these swatches that we created for this one. And I'm gonna put it right here. And make it nice and big. So here's a nice acknowledgement of a truly great uh, Vancouver artist, Musqueam artist. Uh, she's incredible. She's done a lot of really cool public art projects in Vancouver. Um, I suggest that you like dig into who these artists are. You know, we spend a lot of time studying like these um, dead dudes from Europe <laughs> and they were incredible artists too. But we have local artists that are connected to the context that we live in that are phenomenal. And it's worth spending the time to learn who those artists were and the work that they do and what it means to us here living in Vancouver. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to go to your title frame and you're going to go here. So just select the title of it, go to the ellipses, copy link, and go to the submission page, write submission, and you're going to type in your name, and you're going to type in 22.3. So year 2022, third semester, fall, and you're going to call this uh, exercise four, <laughs> exercise four, indigenous acknowledge, indigenous acknowledgement. GD157. So again, who, when, what, who, when, what, and where. And that's it. So thanks for watching. Um, I hope that you got to enjoy this exercise and that you learned something about. Uh, incredible artist and we'll see you on the next one